So we have Doug Lardo from Riot Games. Uh, so go ahead, D Doug, take it away. Hi. So I'm going to apologize in advance. My presentation's a little less stiff than most of the ones I've seen so far. So if there's any jokes like might make you feel uncomfortable, let me know. Um, but my name is Doug. I'm a data center architect at Riot Games. I've been working there for about three years now. And I really like packets, whiteboards, uh, Contrail, Python, um, my dog, and I really hate pickles. So um, <laughs> if you want to get on my good side, let's talk about how those things are on everything. And, uh, I'm from Riot Games, and Riot Games is uh, the largest online game in the world. Uh, we have presence in the United States, South America, uh, Europe, China, uh, we're basically all over. Uh, it's a free-to-play game, and it consists of basically two teams. Uh, each team has five players, and each team has uh, a base that they protect. Uh, the two teams uh, are consisted up of kind of uh, different roles. So you have like one guy with a sword, and then another guy that can heal you, uh, maybe someone shooting a bow and arrow. Uh, another guy casting spells, uh, but each person has a unique role on that team, kind of like each player on a basketball court or a uh, player in a football game. And the two teams fight it out and attempt to destroy each other's base. Um, so we have a ton of really passionate players uh, from all over the world. We have world championships every year. Um, it's legally a sport now, so we can get people from like other parts of the world can get visas to come and play uh, League of Legends. So it's a pretty big deal, it's pretty cool. Um, but with that comes very passionate players um, and they really love their low ping time, they love low latency, um, they expect service to be on at all hours of the day, um, especially in the middle of the night, uh, you know, when they're running 12, 13 hour you know, sessions. Um, so uh, we have a lot going on and we uh, definitely have demanding players and uh, we like to do the best for our players because we're players ourselves. So if you ever want to talk about my favorite champion or what video game I played, I was just having that conversation a minute ago, you know, feel free. So let's get started. Uh, so long story short, our developers just can't ship code fast enough. Uh, as I was saying, we have a global footprint and our data centers are all over the world and the designs range from being very old to very new. So we've been around probably like seven or eight years now. Um, but the first data centers were basically built out of like duct tape and bailing wire and whatever we could find at Costco or at Best Buy that we could just like slap together and under somebody's desk. Um, and those data centers kind of slowly evolved. And then we have the very modern designs, which are like layer three clause architectures, um, you know, spine, leaf, uh, very, very modern. Um, but to our developers, they were suffering because they would try to ship to these different parts of the world um, and the data centers were all different. So our operations teams would go in and they'd have to kind of like know where the firewall rules live and know how to change a VLAN and it was different every time. So um, it took us months to actually deploy a new service uh, just because of so many differences across our data centers. Um, so what we did was we built our own infrastructure as a service kind of platform kind of container as a service, um, we call it R-Cluster. Uh, what R-Cluster is, is uh, at its core, it's, it's Docker-based, um, and we use Contrail to uh, connect all the different virtual networks um, to, you know, to the containers. Um, and everything's self-service, so everything's uh, infrastructure is code-based. Uh, you go in and you create a, a JSON blob that defines your application, how many instances of that application you want, and what location. And then also we define um, the, the networking. Um, I'm just gonna focus on the networking part here. So the one piece that uh, we like to tout a lot, a taught a lot, bleh, talk about a lot, <laughs> um, is the declarative language that we've developed here. So we don't expose IP addresses ever to our customers, we always talk about applications and what application can talk to what other application. And we do that through this kind of JSON blob uh, that we call a self-service blueprint. So we'll specify uh, every application has its own uh, 
level of security. So like I own my application security policy. Uh, so we'll go in and we'll say, this source is allowed to talk to me or that source is allowed to talk to me. And if someone wants to get access from one app to another, they go, actually, we use GitHub as a backend and we create a pull request on their repository. Then they can review it and then push OK. Those merges you know, happen and then um, you know, access is essentially granted. Um, so this is awesome for the infrastructure team because we're no longer the bottleneck. Like People can go in and do whatever they want. Um, and when they get stuck, they just come to us for assistance. Um, so this is, we've come a long way from like trying to figure out where to configure a VLAN and where, what the next free IP address is um, and dealing with the idi idi idiosyncrasies of each data center. But you know, now we're like completely defining our infrastructure as code um, in an app-to-app -app language. So it's been really successful for us. So kind of under the hood how we did it is all these blueprints are stored in GitHub. And then we wrote, uh, we have our own, uh, David Press is in here. Uh, he's my associate back home, but uh, he's a, the champion of the RFCs, which are the internal uh, documentations that we used uh, to kind of like talk about ideas and decide on what we're gonna build. And one of his ideas was just name all of our projects after the RFC that talks about the project. So it's called the RFC 291 Transformer. Um, but what that does is it just scrapes in all those blueprints and it has a global view of the world. It knows what apps can talk to what. Um, and then it cranks out all the networking policies that we're gonna need and then just tramples anything that's inside of Contrail. So every five minutes or so, this job runs out of a Jenkins server and we just say, if it's in the blueprints, then that's what exists in Contrail. Um, so what this does for us is it effectively makes Contrail stateless. Like, yeah, we still kind of track like, you know, what Docker containers are attached to, um, you know, what virtual interfaces. But if we were to lose the whole Contrail cluster, like we can just rebuild everything from scratch and we know that everything's in code. So, you know, rebuilding a lost controller is no problem. And also if we ever need to do disaster recovery, you know, we can also do that too. So here's a quick overview of kind of how this all works together. Um, engineer will go in and make the blueprint. The blueprint gets render, rendered through the transformer and pushed to Contrail. And then that iteration loop can just you know, occur as things change. Uh, one added benefit of this is now, we, since we have all of our security policies in the central source on GitHub, uh, we can have the security team go in and look at the JSON and say, OK, this is a uh, reasonable policy or it's not, and they can uh, have one central point of truth that they know is definitely what's being affected in infrastructure because, like I said, we trample everything in production um, every five minutes. Um, so that's much easier to program against. It's easier to audit. Um, they know who changed what because they get that in GitHub. Um, there's, you know, a, a bunch of benefits just having it in code rather than like and IP addresses, for example. Uh, so, yeah, the developers have full visibility. The security teams can audit. Um, and since we have now kind of unlocked the potential for our developers to help us with our infrastructure problems, some of the developers said, well, I don't want to write JSON. Like, this is annoying. Like, I want a GUI. So they just, like, without really talking to the network team, because they didn't have to talk to us, they just went off and made a GUI. And like, it's beautiful. Like they use this cool new framework and it's modern looking. It kind of looks like GitHub a little bit. Um, they implemented all the like business logic inside of that system. Um, so they get, the users get feedback early and it's, it's just been great. Um, so we estimated putting the system in probably saved us about three years worth of um, you know, manually editing access lists. Um, and that's not including um, all the rest of the just troubleshooting that you know, inherently would come with that. Um, so the any questions before I move on? Um, networking is code piece. Yeah. Could you uh, use, please use the mic, use the mic. Yeah. for the remoteies? Uh, you 
You mentioned the security audit can take place at a band. Is that done as part of the process of the teams building their uh, configuration files, or is that done afterwards? And if so, is that a bit of a risk? Yeah, so it's we got like, what, five guys on the security team or something like that. Like, it's pretty small, and we have like hundreds of developers. So while the security team would love to sit there and audit every change, it's just not practical. Um, so they're making best uh, practice recommendations and periodically auditing, but it's up to the developer to be in charge of their own application security. So they ultimately own the risk. And what we're trying to do as experts is like advise them on why it's good to do least privilege and why it's good to not do 10 slash zero. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, have you ever logged into like EC2 where developers like configured their own like policies? It's just like, like, oh my, like, okay. Like, why do you even do this? Like, it's just ridiculous. So uh, there's that line there. Um, but we don't want to block, but at the same time, we don't want to be insecure. So we're, we're constantly, uh, you know, adjusting that threshold. Yeah. Mm. It's a tough balance. Anything else? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So you said the networking is stateless. So if it lose connection with the, where you have the state and you restart a node, so the, the forwarding plane like is already programmed like from Contrail. Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, if the controllers were completely erased, um, then you know the cluster would collapse at that point. Like there's a headless mode which would you know, continue forwarding if the if the controllers aren't there. But this is assuming like total loss of the database. Like I don't know, a, cr a crater hit it or something, or like we lost uh, a power surge and everything. We're talking like disaster level. Um, so we could spin up three new controllers, like fire up Ansible, and then push the button on the transformer, and then just all our policies would be back in there. Are you saying there is state in the controllers? Because what if the controllers are fine, but one of the you know, compute nodes goes away and comes back? He's lost all its state, and you've, you've kept your state outside of the controllers. Is that right, or did I misunderstand? I think you're talking more like the architecture of Contrail. Right, which is like, but, but you know. But you said Contrail is stateless, right? So The way that we put all of our configuration in the external database, I mean, what I'm trying to say is like, I can take that Contrail cluster and everything in it and destroy it. And then build a brand new cluster and then push it in and it looks ex exactly the same as the old cluster. Okay. So I think there's still temporary state in, in Contrail, in, in your application, but your master state is, is offline. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you want to talk more about like yeah. how the failover and the router flows, and yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so self-service networking right now only exists in our cluster, uh, and our existing platform, which is League of Legends based, uh, is kind of still hanging around and hasn't really changed too often. The core platform has, you know, been built when the game was originally built. But they're not cloud native apps, so it's still in that world where a, a failure of a particular node is pretty disruptive. Um, we've done a lot of stuff to bring up HA, like putting in better database replication, for example, but the uh, actual platform itself is still kind of fragile if the infrastructure gets ripped out from underneath it. Um, so <clears throat> we are more or less not touching that part so much. Um, but as we add on new systems, we're putting them as close to the platform as possible. Um, so one thing we did recently, it was called uh, a loot, uh, which is a way for players to buy shards. Uh, it's kind of like chunks of stuff. So uh, if I, after a game, I would get like a, a piece of a, a champion. But if you get like three of these things, then you can unlock it to get a champion, for example. Um, so it's kind of like a microtransaction fun, open the box, see what you get type system. Um, but that, that was real important to be very close to the database and close to the core platform because there's so many transactions and you know, messages that went back and forth. Uh, so we needed those, those two systems to coexist. Um, and to complicate things, a lot of our uh, platforms now are moving entirely to Amazon. Uh, so if we want to keep our goal of Okay, developers, like you have this one ecosystem, you write to our cluster, and then wherever you ship it in the world, it feels exactly the same to you. 
uh, we needed to bring our infrastructure into Amazon and we needed to do that elegantly and transparently to our developers. Um, but as you guys probably know, Amazon is a challenge. Um, oh, let's put Contrail in Amazon. You know, it should be, should be easy. Like, Doug, what are, you, what, are you, what are you doing this afternoon? You want to maybe spin up a V router? And you're like, oh, yeah, no problem. It's all software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrong. Jerk. <laughs> <laughs> it takes you months. Uh, so, so we like tried to just put the gateway right in there. Um, it's kind of like, okay, that, this, this is probably an easy thing to do. Um, but with Riot, everyone has a ton of ideas, and we kind of got to like, this is a good inflection point. Like maybe we should consider our options. Uh, so we thought about writing a brand new transformer that specifically just wrote things for Amazon. Uh, we thought about just ditching IP everything like for security. Like why do we use IP addresses anyway? Those are annoying. Can't we just do some sort of PKI app to app encryption? thing and I won't go into that because that's just years of work. Um, we could just write to IP tables like that's everywhere, right? Like everyone loves IP tables. There's no way that that would cause you administrative headaches or operational challenges. <laughs> but like, you know, it's an option. Uh, or uh, the one we ultimately decided on as our first kind of stab at the thing was to put the gateway as close to Amazon as possible. Uh, if we just bring the gate, a physical gateway, like, and just plug it like right outside the Amazon, you know, peering point, then we can just loop traffic out and bring it right back in again. It should, should be good, right? Um, but we wanted to try the, the first thing first, which was let's just spin up a, a gateway. Uh, we tried out the VSRX. Uh, the VMX wasn't out yet. Um, this was pretty close and it was simple and, you know, kind of worked. Uh, but without some caveats and some challenges. Um, so you could use a VSRX, but you had to turn off the firewall part of its brain because it doesn't really work uh, unless you're in packet mode. So that's like overkill. Um, and then also in Amazon, you have to disable source destination checking because the whole system does like a reverse, you know, did, is this IP, like, did you send that? That's not your IP, then I'm, I'm chucking it. Um, so you have to, disable that everywhere. Um, but what we found is it only works within a single VPC. Um, so we had kind of these questions like, why is this happening? Like, why would it work within a VPC and not out of a VPC? This must be some Amazon something that's going on. Um, but probably most frustrating <laughs> to me as a network engineer is that there's no concept of any routing protocols. Like, you can't run BGP inside of Amazon to Amazon. You can't run eCMP. You can't run OSPF to BGP or anything, like it's just like, you get one static route to one interface and you can't even do two statics and do like a floating static. It's just, it's really hard. It's just like, it's the, was this the 90s? Like it's just like, we couldn't believe that there's like no options. You know, we talked to the product team and everything and roadmap and blah, 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 but like we need something today. Um, and without these routing protocols, how are we gonna do HA? How are we gonna do M plus one? What if we get to the biggest instance size and I can't send any more packets through this thing. Like, I got a million players that are pissed at me right now. Like, what do I do? So here's a quick little diagram of summarizing all that. Basically, we tried putting a single gateway inside and fail. <laughs> so hardware gateway, those work, right? So as I said before, we'll just basically slap a gateway in our pops, which we had direct connect peering, and we just tried to leverage those. And this should be awesome because we know the gateways work physically and we can GRE tunnel in. What's a few more boxes, right? Juniper sales guy showed up that day. He was, he was like, this is a great idea. He loved it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Ship them all over the world. <laughs> so, uh, the big thing, though, is like we get this, I call it the sad trombone, and it's because <laughs> so it like heads all the way out to the pop, loops around, and then you know, gets its way all the way back. And we measured this, we did some estimations, and we said, yo, this should probably be fine. Most of our apps aren't that sensitive, right? Well, yeah, they are. Um, they got cranky. 
Uh, plus, it felt really weird. Like, you're in the same VPC, but I'm getting this ridiculously long delay. Like, why is this happening? Like, developers didn't understand it, and then we tell them that we made their traffic go to like Jahunga and back. They just they wanted to throw us out. They, they thought we were kidding. Um, they were not happy. Um, and, and sometimes we didn't have Direct Connect. Like we just didn't have that option. And some of our sites are in kind of remote parts of the world and have a, a huge need to build their own data center there. Um, so it kind of defeats the point. Um, to be able to build a site uh, completely in cloud is like kind of one of the reasons you buy a cloud. If you're gonna like <laughs> go get a cloud and like bring your hardware and like, it just felt terrible. So yeah, it just feels bad, man. <laughs> so there's gotta be a better way, right? Um, and we kind of looked at the pieces and we said, well, EC2 understands instances uh, and that's about it. So maybe there's a way that we can dumb our routers down <laughs> to speak instance. And we started doing the math and we're like, this might be doable. There's pretty much uh, eight limit, inter eight interface limit um, per instance, and we can put 30 IPs per interface. Um, that's 200. Okay. So let's try it. Um, and long story short, it, it ended up working. Uh, so one of the benefits is that it uses the native address space of the VPC, um, which was part of the problem with the uh, why those packets were being dropped when we moved between uh, between the VPCs is because Amazon has this uh, virtual gateway that you use to traverse between VPCs, and if if you think of that source destination check that lives on each physical interface for each instance. Um, you know, you can kind of enable and disable that, but when you move between VPCs, there's no checkbox or no phone call you can make that lets you turn that off. So what we ended up doing is just like, let's just steal a bunch of IPs from this physical, physical VPC um, and then just basically bring them all into the router. Um, and then from there, we can GRE tunnel to wherever we need to go, um, especially uh, back to like our data centers where our uh, core platform sometimes would live, or more importantly, um, I won't go too much into this, but we've built a global backbone basically to get players into our network quicker, um, to one, have no politics as far as like, oh, at and is peering with, not to pick an at and but Cox or Verizon or whoever, um, and there's like contention between who's gonna pay for this bandwidth, and there's like this indirect issue where some players are coming from some directions and we're getting this brown out, but we can't pinpoint it because our stuff looks fine, but all these players are in pain. Um, so we just bring them into our network quicker, you know, shoot them across the MPLS backbone and then dump them in. Um, and it's also a huge uh, DDoS mitigation uh, network as well. We leverage Anycast and we have all these, um, we call them unicorns that are out at the edges, um, you know, doing mitigation. Um, so we really want to make sure our players come in through our edge, but we want to leverage the compute within within Amazon. Um, so it works. No sad trombone. Uh, we leverage our edge. Uh, we can still use GRE tunnels to do whatever we need. Uh, a couple little things that we still needed to iron out is you have to monitor the gateways, basically. Uh, make sure they don't um, you know, die. And in order to do that, uh, to, to do failover effectively, what you need to do is make a bunch of API calls into EC2. So if I have four gateways, each one has 200 IPs on them, um, I kind of need like a fifth one that is empty, is kind of the N plus one node. Um, and then when I notice gateway one is done, I'll go run to EC2 and say, hey, for all those secondary IP addresses that were previously living on router one, like quick reprogram them and route them over to you know, gateway five. Uh, so uh, that happens pretty quick, it happens like two seconds. Uh, so as long as you can detect the outage and um, you know, have a script that moves the IPs, um, excuse me, it, it happens pretty quick. 
Um, and one other thing that's nice is it's N plus one scalable now. So we're getting around a gig or so of traffic out of a, a, a virtual MX right now. So if we need more, we just you know, add another virtual MX and then Contrail uh, just sees that as an equal cost next hop. Um, so it, it scales pretty nicely. A few optimizations if you're gonna try and do this yourself. You don't need to put IPs on the gateway interfaces. Just put INET on them and just traffic goes in. So uh, you save yourself seven IPs there. Um, it simplifies management too. Uh, and one other thing we did is we took that same idea but now we made a centralized VPC. So we took all the V routers that we, I'm sorry, the gateways, the VMXs that we wanted, and we put those in a central VPC and as teams uh, spin up their own VPCs or we spin up more clusters, uh, we just peer with that uh, through VPC to VPC peering. And then we can you know, scale that central resource as opposed to each team having to you know, own and control their own set of gateways. Um, and yeah, and then, like I said before, we're using the hardware gateways um, for the public edge, which uh, also gives us ECMP, which is really nice. You can't get ECMP within Amazon because it doesn't have the notion of such a thing. You know, it relies on um, you know, DNS or an ELB. But if you pipe it out to an external gateway, um, then you can anycast that and then ECMP that, that traffic uh, over GRE tunnels uh, to, your, to your compute nodes. So this brings me to my hopes and dreams. Um, wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to deal with gateways? Like that's by far the most uh, contentious part of the solution. Like when you compare Contrail with, like, say, Calico, for example, the first thing they bring up is like, oh, well, you know, you don't need gateways because it just all magically works. Um, but part of the value of Contrail is that you can do service chaining, you can do all these intelligent things um, with it. So we're like, well, what if we just put packets right on the wire? Um, you know. Would this work? Uh, we said, well, if the top of rack can just learn the routes for the tenants from like the central controller, then that will fix all of my, you know, BGP, uh, IGP style uh, clause fabric routing. So I know the next hop for this destination, this tenant, is the compute node. Um, I put policy on it just like I always would, and then when I need to service chain. Um, you know, I could just then leverage the tunnels. So uh, we're hoping this, this can come to fruition because we really view it as kind of a best of both worlds. Uh, you could put a compute node in and just have the traffic immediately uh, exit the vRouter if you don't need multi-tenancy, uh, which is great for the enterprise. Um, but uh, it also works great in Amazon because you don't have to deal with you know, any of the complications of what we're, we're working with right now. So please, Contrail, please. So yeah, uh, that's the end. There's a cool League of Legends game graphic, and any questions? Thank you. Just out of curiosity, what sort of services are you looking to have chained? Um, uh, we have the no services chained right now, actually. Okay. Yeah, um, we've looked a little bit into it. Uh, most of our service chaining, uh, we actually have the application developers leverage um, service discovery. Mm -hmm. So like my app looks up in the central uh, database of what other apps I need to talk to and then they just create TCP connections between them. So we haven't had the need to use the network to bend the traffic. Mm -hmm. um, but we've thought like maybe for like an IPS or um, some sort of uh, transparent bump in the wire service that we want to kind of hide um, that people can't see or just uh, I won't tell you what the project name was called, but we'll call it uh, latency as a service, something that we wanted to add. <laughs> I picked on a particular ISP. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we'd want to put that in and then just slow everyone's packets down to simulate a poor network connection so we could test out um, you know, what that experience would be. So those are some things we've thought about. Yeah, just like you're, because I've sort of done that sort of case before with Calico. Let's talk offline on ways we can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? I 
favorite not, champion is Thresh. Thanks for asking. <laughs> not, thank you, Doug, for everything. Uh, let's give him another round of applause.